Let's be real. We all need to take a break from alcohol. Luckily, Athletic Brewing offers award-winning, great-tasting NA beers for any occasion. Take a break from alcohol with something that tastes great, from their easy-drinking Athletic Light to something a bit more hoppy with Free Wave or even something dark and bold like All Out. Try Athletic Brewing today by going to unitedwedrink.com slash athletic and enjoy free shipping on all orders over $50. That's unitedwedrink.com slash athletic. Athletic Brewing, beer fit for all times. The opinions and statements in this podcast do not represent those of the hosts, employers, co-workers, family, or imaginary friends. Now enjoy the show. Happy hour, more like amateur hour. Welcome to United We Drink. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another new episode of the United We Drink podcast right here on unitedwedrink.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever fine podcasts are found. My name is Mike Urevich, and I fucking hate baseball. I <laughs> fucking hate that miserable, <laughs> shitty, fucking beautiful, loving, energetic, but terrible, stupid, fucking wonderful, stupid game. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm, and I'm Kevin, I'm Kevin Abbott and I agree because both of our teams <laughs> got knocked out within what, like what, 40, 24 hours, 48 no, hours. It was, other? it was a few days. Yeah. We, we were out, uh, when Wednesday night, uh, was, uh, when we got okay. knocked out, you, you at least made it to another weekend. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so for anyone who doesn't fo- who isn't following, Mike obviously a Phillies fan. I'm a Detroit Tigers fan. I-, I have a little different perspective on this, Mike, because my team was not only not expected to be a playoff team, my team was not expected to have a winning record. And I'm talking about they weren't expected to have a winner rec- winning record around the All Star break. I'm not talking about the start of the season. So the fact that they made that improbable run to the postseason, won a playoff series against uh, Houston. I'm really bummed. Like, yeah, it was a gut punch, and I felt pretty crappy for several hours after that loss. But it, trying to keep the right perspective of this was awesome. It was a great season, and I'm hopeful that they'll actually spend some money in the off season and bring in some more players because, as good as it's been, they still can't hit to save their goddamn lives. Um, th- it is just Kevin and I today. Uh, Tim is not joining us. Um, but uh, it's kind of funny because Kevin's team went on a monumental run while Tim's team went on a monumental uh, just shitting of the bed to kick e- one kicks the other out of the playoff picture. So, well, and the other thing is, like, he, he's Tim's not here to defend himself. I feel like you're jumping, you know, <laughs> kind of. That, that's not very kind. Well, Tim is on assignment. He's uh, doing beer things and interviewing people and finding out things about the industry. And I'm sure he'll rep- be reporting on that soon. He's on a secret mission down in Guatemala, doing things that. Uh, oh, I shouldn't have said where he was at. Uh, blown in his blown his cover. Uh, <laughs> Kevin, what are you drinking tonight? So I just finished a Vine Stefaner Fest beer, which is just perfect, just absolutely delicious. And I've also got a backup here of the Smutty Nose Pumpkin Ale, and I've got a Bell's Black Note. Oh, geez. That, yeah. You're, yeah, you're I, expecting a, a shitty show, huh? Oh, <laughs> listen, I, I, I'm going to make it that way. That's how, that's how we get this kind of professional uh, podcast is by me getting shit face drunk. Uh, but yeah, the black notes, one of the ones I picked up when I was back home and, uh, what a, what a great beer. This is my last of my four and I'm going to take a little, not a complete break over the next several months, uh, through the rest of the year where I'm, I said, I'm not going to be drinking at all, but I'm going to, I'm pumping the brakes a little bit. So I'm trying to get some of the more enticing stuff out of my fridge. Uh, and I'm have to do it all tonight. So (laughs) 
This is my yeah, mission. You, you think that these these quality shows uh, just come naturally to us? No, there's there's a lot of lubrication that comes into making this show work. Performance drinks, yes. <laughs> Uh, I'm drinking. Um, I'm drinking cider. Uh, I'm having a Stark from my my friends at Plowman Farm Cidery in Pennsylvania. Their seventh anniversary of bottling this beer or uh, this cider. Just wonderful. Just a lovely dry cider. This is my favorite time of year for for drinking ciders in the fall, as fall as South Florida gets, and. Uh, I, I so much enjoy that. Also, just have a little bit of Amaro here as well, uh, because, you know, why have beer tonight? Um, You're also very fancy. I just, I see you drinking like that, that cider out of that fancy glass, and then you're drinking Amaro <laughs> along with it. But you don't understand, is he actually, he's actually ve- wearing a velveteen robe and smoking a pipe. Once again, yes. this is not a visual medium, so you are not seeing this, but I am, and it all tracks. And you, you don't get to, to see it because the, the, the pipe is the punchline indicator. Uh, when, I, when I take a hit of a pipe, that's, that's when you're supposed to be laughing. So it doesn't really help for this, I know. It, it um, also doesn't help that you don't make jokes. But those are two <laughs> things that are difficult for that whole vibe. Uh, all right, so we are... Going to talk. We we tend to for the show usually be pretty negative, but we're usually <laughs> negative towards others. <laughs> very very little do we accept any blame um, and throw ourselves under the proverbial or literal buses. Um, we wouldn't be here if we were under literal buses, but we have decided that for today's episode we are going to talk about when we have made mistakes and uh i when i think you brought this up as a topic idea uh i was at first like like oh this is gonna be hard to think of uh mistakes because i'm fucking amazing it it really wasn't all that hard (laughs) (laughs) to think of mistakes um I have a. I, I typically say that I'm wrong four times before I get out of bed in the morning, and that kind of mentality has definitely permeated many of my uh, decisions. And not just decisions. I, I was thinking when I thought about this idea, I, I was thinking about everything from like branding mistakes, like oh we shouldn't have done that, we should have chose that color. I mean, it could be that simple, or just catastrophic mistakes of like stupid shit you did in the brewery. That might have like ruined a whole batch of beer or uh, compromised uh, something or or cost lots of money uh, in destruction and damage. And uh, everything I just said, I've done. So uh, I thought it would be fun to talk about. I think some of the things that I will say have probably been touched on maybe a little bit in previous episodes, but we've had so many now that I thought it would be a good way to kind of consolidate these and also, I should say that I think that Tim needs to have like a, like a, you know, a, 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 an episode where he gets to like spend like 20 minutes throwing some of his in there, right? Like oh, yeah, a, for sure. You know, an, a little addition uh, to this because I'm sure that he has a lot of fun stuff to talk about too. Oh, yeah, definitely. And then and then it will turn into part two of this episode because there will be no way that we can just cut that off at that point <laughs> so and, and look also forward I, to that and also i should say this is that because this po- this podcast comes out in every every two weeks or so in the next two weeks i will make 10 or 15 stupid decisions and then we can i can just go on and have more material because that's the way things work yeah so kevin why don't you tell us about a mistake that you made <laughs> So uh, there's a couple that really stand out to me from uh, when I was building and doing the first batches for Funky Buddha and the Oakland Park location. So for many of you who don't know this, the original brewery was in a closet in a hookah bar and we were brewing on like a home brew system. And that's where I learned how to brew 
for for the most part. And that was for a couple of years that we did that. And then when we were building the actual like 15,000 square foot, which became like 500 million square feet, what they have now, I was just learning for the first time how to brew on uh, commercial equipment. So I, I it was literally, I had, I was a home brewer who was professional because I was brewing on home brew style equipment and then trying to translate that. And we had help, but the first batch of Floridian, the Floridian Hefeweizen, which is still a core beer for them. The first ever batch that was served at the grand opening of a funky Buddha. I just forgot to evacuate the uh, parasitic acid from the tank. So I ran my parasitic cycle with a barrel of water. And it's been a long time, but I can't remember exactly what the concentration of how much parasitic I put in there. Um, and, uh, you know, sanitized the tank, did everything right there. Forgot to blow it out. So I knocked out 60 barrel. Uh, I guess it would have been 30 barrels of Hefeweizen into a barrel of parasitic water. Now, parasitic acid in water denatures over time. So it didn't really hurt the beer. It diluted it by a barrel. But because I was so smart because I was so crafty. I just so happened to have brewed a more concentrated batch of Floridian for that first time because I didn't know what I was doing. And it just kind of balanced out. Like I only missed like OG by a, by a small portion and the ABV was, you know, within the range of, of, uh, variants uh but yeah so I, I but when i first did it because it was i think it i think it was batch two i think i brewed hop gun the first time in floridian because those were the two cores and it was batch two and i had no idea what the difference in that kind of concentration was i'd never worked with those kind of volumes before and i was like oh i i just wasted my entire day this is this is going to be terrible and for whatever reason it turned out to be okay how quickly like when did you figure it out I want to say it was like mid knockout because I was cut because that's when you're kind of like temperature has stabilized and you're just kind of looking over and I was just kind of mentally going through my notes and I was like, I don't remember purging that tank and blowing out the and then my eyes get big and wide. And I realize I knocked out into and then I went immediately and checked um, the gravity. Because at that point, we're only talking about a handful of barrels in, in there. And it was much more dilute than what was what I measured in the kettle uh, as it was coming out. So I, I found out uh, relatively quickly. I don't think I told anyone. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I went to uh, the owner, Ryan, and said, uh, hey, yeah, I might have totally fucked up this batch of our core beer for the first time. I think I just kind of kept it under my hat. And when it actually turned out to be kind of okay, I was like, all right, cool. Oh, man. Uh, and you, I, I, I hate to follow that up by t talking about a, not a mistake that I made, but a mistake that someone else made. But that was not yeah. the spirit of things, Mike. No, it is not. Uh, so, so I won't. I'll save that for another time. Uh, because I'm sure I'll find a reason to bring it up. No, Mike, go, go ahead and talk about that, because I, I have one big mistake that I definitely am going to talk about that someone else did in my orbit. Uh, so I know ahead. at at our previous brewery, uh, well after uh, you and I had left, after Joel had left, um, uh, someone brewing over there uh, knocked out an entire batch of beer down the drain, uh, because... <laughs> 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 they never they never closed the manifold at the the absolute out of the tank and never opened the absolute out of the tank so the entire <laughs> batch just went down the drain and and then he realized it after it was all gone and just closed everything up didn't tell anyone and left <laughs> and came back in the next day and rebrewed <laughs> And and then then told one person there about it. Was it you? No, they told you. I I heard I heard through the grapevine because obviously that one person told told a person who told a person like I found I found this out at a completely different brewery. Um, but my 
my first thing was is that I have very often uh, mixed mixed up secondary ingredients like uh, like dry hoppings, uh, fruits, uh, things like that. Uh, especially, I, I did this unfortunately a fair bit at at Moss Mill. Um, dry hoppings mostly. I would dry hop the wrong tank with with the <laughs> with the wrong beer or with the wrong hops. Uh, I did. I probably did that like two or three times. Um, but I did luck out that every single one of those times was for one-off beers. So it wasn't like I was screwing up our, our, um, flagship IPA with something. It was like, oh no, we're brewing this new specialty IPA. I'm supposed to do this, this, and this, and this. all right, cool. And then I'm doing, I, I put like our flagships, uh, dry hopping into this specialty beer. And then I'm like, wait, where's, I had buckets for these, like, Oh, fuck. <laughs> um, I've put I've put double the amount of fruit into uh, a beer before because I couldn't remember if I had done it already. <laughs> I was like, I'll just do it again. Like, what harm could this be? <laughs> um, and and yes, uh, very very rarely. Well, no, at Moss Mill, I would I would tell because I love Nick. Nick like. Nick would just look at me and he'd just be like, "All right, don't just try not to do it again." Um, but yeah, I when when I was in the brewery, that was that was probably one of my my instant my things that I I fucked up a, a bit was you know dry hops, fruit, like oh wrong beer, double the amount. So when you were talking about the beer going down the drain, a Finnish wart. At least six times in my career, I started, uh, you know, transferring from the lauder ton to the kettle and the kettle was wide open. And instead of capturing, you know, those really rich first runnings, which are so necessary to get your gravity, I put, you know, a quarter of a barrel, a half a barrel down the drain before I figured out what the heck was going on. Like, why isn't the kettle filling up? And my brain doesn't go immediately to, oh, the fucking absolute is out, out is cl- is open you moron it's like oh is the pump cavitating or is something weird going on no the most simple thing possible is going on you have to do things the right way uh another thing this is this is one of my my favorites that i was just a complete moron with this is another uh funky uh story so we had a three and a half barrel uh, pilot system so we had a 30 barrel Preveller system want to say we had four 60 barrel tanks and then we to start out with and then we had this three and a half barrel pilot system which turned out to be like more of a two and a half barrel pilot system because it was a crappy ass system uh and then we bought a skid of three seven barrel fermenters and it was on a skid it was all connected and it was all the glycol lines were stainless steel piped uh, from like when you enter the skid like you didn't have to go directly into each tank you went into this you know manifold of stainless steel piping, which was real cool from your glycol lines in the ceiling. And for those of you who don't know, glycol is what circulates throughout a tank to cool. It's the refrigerant to be able to cool and temperature control your tanks. So uh, when I was, I don't know, maybe cleaning, I don't know what I was doing, but I was probably doing something I shouldn't have been doing in the first place. And because I was so used to taking apart stainless steel in like a manifold for transfers, for cleaning processes, I decided for some reason to pull a clamp off the back of the tank where the glycol was running. And the glycol was running. And glycol is very cold, meaning that I couldn't, my hands, I tried to get the clamp back on and it didn't really uh, also fit. very slippery too. Slippery, cold, and also because of the nature of the way that the the pipes were like contorted, it wasn't a flush fit on things, right? So getting these together in the first place with the gasket was challenging. So I couldn't get the 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 clamp back on. I popped a clamp and spewing glycol everywhere. Glycol is not cheap <laughs> and glycol. You don't just have it. You can't just pick up more at the corner store. You have to order it. You have to find someone that has it. So I am spewing glycol onto the floor. 
uh, one of the partners is watching me do this because I, I don't know if I started screaming or something and people come out and he's like telling me to fix it and I'm trying and my hands are trembling. Let's fix it. Yeah. Well, Kevin, yeah. Fix it. <laughs> and as this is happening, we were still in, uh, we still had like construction workers and stuff doing work in the, uh, in the brewery and the only shutoff was at the ceiling. Oh. The shut off to the line was at the ceiling. You demand it was, uh, you know, whatever. I don't, I don't, even, I don't think it was computer, uh, computer timed or whatever. Maybe that wasn't hooked up yet. I can't remember. This, this happened 15 years ago or whatever it was. 12 years ago, 13 years ago. So uh, there's a guy who's like a plumber on a scissor lift, and he's I want to say 40 feet away. So he jumps on this scissor lift. And he's like trying to like bear it down to move as fast as possible, but it's moving like a scissor lift, like negative one mile an hour. He's just putting towards the area he can go. And I'm still trying to get this and my hands are freezing and they're cold and slippery and I'm still trying to do it. It's getting all over. It's in my mouth. It's like all over me. I'm bathing in glycol. And then he slowly rises up on the scissor lift cuts this thing off i don't know how much we we lost maybe a half a barrel or something like that of glycol and i remember uh casey sense one of the owners he had like a clipboard or something in his hand it probably wasn't a clipboard maybe i've just seen too much i'm equating this to like a you know a a nfl coach and he slams it on the ground he's like do you know how much that costs and my hands are trembling and i got glycol in my mouth and it's all over me that was fun that that was something that I probably shouldn't have done. That was pretty pretty dumb. You know, when you first said clipboard, I was imagining him just standing there, like staring at you, and then just like check, like <laughs> like making like very deliberate, drastic marks on a on a sheet of paper uh, while watching you do that. <laughs> it, and before you get into another one of yours, that was not the only time that I popped the wrong clamp on something. And took a bath. The next time I did it was I did it in cold liquor. Uh, it was cold liquor going to our heat exchanger. And I don't know why I did it. I was in the middle of running something and I pulled that clamp for, I think I was trying to like reseat it because it looked like off, like it wasn't meeting correctly. And I was worried was about it. Was it leaking? So I, I, maybe. No, it just looked. <laughs> it, it, honestly, it probably it looked just at you looked you weird. <laughs> It looked at me weird. It looked like it was a problem. And I wasn't thinking about the fact that it was actually running liquid at the time. And I pulled the clamp and took a bath in cold liquor. So I, it was good that in the early days we had a shower uh, there because I, I utilized that many times when I took baths in different liquids that apparently I didn't realize what I was doing with. That's crazy that you you have worked for three breweries and two out of three of them have had showers in them fucking lucky you <laughs> I, we we did that on purpose at, at funky and, and i demanded to have one at barrel of monks because in the early days i had to brew beer and then go sell it you know yeah. I, I had to go do events right afterwards i had to brew a batch of beer get to take a shower and go do a beer dinner so a lot of that was out of necessity it doesn't get used very much anymore but yeah that was a big thing you know, I I can't remember remember specifics, but I know that I have uh, taken the wrong clamp off of the side of of a valve a couple times before. Um, there was there, and I can't even remember which brewery it was at, but I remember doing it one time and catching myself immediately, like it, like the butterfly valve was undone. The first side of the clamp came up. And I was like, oh, fuck, I'm on the wrong side here and got it back down to where nothing, nothing happened. Like it it just sat still perfectly to where I could do that. But yeah, there was a couple times that nothing ever uh, under pressure, uh, like or or under severe pressure, like a bright tank. FVs, I've done that in on like uh, the racking arm uh, or the, the absolute out before. I think it was our first batch of Nuance Saison, which used to be a core for us, and now we do it sporadically because no one gives a shit about Saisons. But uh, I was 
brewing that and my partner uh bill was uh i think he either wanted to brew it because B- bill's a brewer he went to brewing school and so many of the ba- of the barrel amongst beers are his baby and while he wasn't you know he's a radiologist by trade he didn't brew the beers regularly when we opened but he would want to do specialty beers and stuff like that and still does to this day uh, but I, either he brewed it or he was there helping me with the brew and <laughs> He went to take apart the transfer manifold uh, after we had knocked out an entire batch. I think it was the first batch of nuance, and he pulled off the absolute out, and uh, not not like the 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 the, the four inch tri clamp at the absolute bottom, but the the butterfly valve that functions as the absolute out. He pulled yeah. that off, and I'm on the brew house. I'm just like cleaning everything up. I'm you know washing everything out. I'm spraying everything down. And I just hear, oh, fuck. And there's just, you know, 20 barrels of just brewed wort just spewing out of this thing. And I run down and I remember this from either this happened to me or maybe like Matt Manthe told me one day, like, if this ever happens, open the valve. Because you won't, the pressure will be too great. You can't put a closed system against it. You won't be able to fight against that pressure. But if you open the valve, the liquid will still flow. You're still going to be losing liquid, but you can center it and you can get your gasket in and you can get the uh, the butterfly valve back on. And then you can close the valve after your clamps back on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But every, it was so cold and slippery once again i don't know why so this is another liquid that i bathed in because i was trying to get this thing on and i Definitely couldn't not hot ones no no but it, it was uh not yet no i didn't have any of that happen i got some hot liquor in my boot once that wasn't fun but uh i, I it took a little bit but i finally got it on and it was very very <laughs> we lost a lot of liquid that day and i felt bad for bill because he you know he was just opening this brewery and you know wanted to help and just didn't know you know he was trying to help out and hadn't really worked with that kind of equipment before and that was the result of it at the end of the day because of the amount of volume in a 20 barrel tank and how little can come out of an inch and a half uh you know opening we probably actually didn't even lose that much in the grand scheme of things uh but i I, I, another bath i had to take yeah that one was sticky. I didn't enjoy that one. I, I would assume so. Yeah. <laughs> Unfermented wort. Very sugary and sticky. Oh, you know the, the worst thing? It wasn't the cold because it wouldn't have been knocked out that cold. The problem was it kept spewing up in my eyes. And I've got glasses. So it's spewing up in my glasses. I throw my glasses off and then it's just getting in my eyes. So now I've got like sweet sticky wart in my eyes and i'm trying to put this thing back on the comedy of errors so with with my current position on on being a more of a marketing guy uh i don't tend to make mistakes in the breweries uh but i i do make mistakes with our social media uh actually a good bit um and <laughs> A lot of times I can catch myself within like a few seconds. Um, but I actually had w- one of these instances happen to me uh, just this past Friday. Um, <laughs> where, so we are a, for all intents and purposes, an FSU bar, uh, Florida State University football. Uh, we, we do stuff, we show the games, we have the sound on, blah, blah, blah. blah. So, uh, er, I I'll post like stories for like when we have games on and every week I, I just, I have, I Google FSU schedule, pull it up. Who are we playing? Okay. The, on which day, what time? All right. Let me put together my little graphic and put that out there. And so I, I looked, I've just pulled it up and I just saw next game Friday, uh, versus Duke 7 PM. I didn't even bother looking at the the date because I knew that we and I by me saying we that feels fucking dirty because FSU isn't my fucking team, uh, but they they already had a bye week earlier in the the season and usually college football teams don't have multiple bye weeks, um, so I'm like oh it is Friday 
Uh, so let me just put together the graphic and put that out there. Nope, it's next Friday. They were on by uh, this week. So uh, someone someone very quickly responded to that. And I'm like, fuck, <laughs> delete, delete, delete across all the all the platforms. Um, but yeah, I I will tend to sometimes get a, a mistake out there. I've sent out a, a newsletter before for um, for an event with a completely different event uh, as the title for the newsletter and my boss was like can you unsend that i'm like no <laughs> that that's not that's a not thing the, that's not the way that works <laughs> but uh i was like i uh, i can send a correction e email but yeah like those those things happen uh, a good bit like i said most of the times like it'll I will see it right as I'm hitting send and be like, Whoa. like, oh, okay, just got to go edit that now. Um, hopefully a bunch of people didn't see it, but who, who, who am I kidding? No one fucking sees social media posts from businesses. <laughs> right. I, I mean, I'm, I, uh, I feel good about that because there's been so many times. We've had multiple social media companies working with us. We rarely have had to do this ourselves. and. Listen, I like the people we've worked with over the years. Our current company is great. I, I love working with them. But they're still human beings, and they still make a lot of mistakes. And the amount of times where I've we've put out like, I mean, this something like this, anniversary party, this, 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 and this, and someone will respond with, shouldn't you put the date? Yeah, we probably should have put the date of when that was going to happen. Shouldn't you put the time? I think sure. I've done that to you. Yeah. yeah. Oh no. <laughs> Mike Mike has has monitored our social media accounts many times and been like, uh, Kevin, you know that's not a live link that you put in there because you can't link off of Instagram. So that seems <laughs> odd that your people would do that. There's been a lot of that over the years with the social media stuff. Uh, but I I'll, I'll transition and I talked about some stupid things I've done in the brewery. And by the way, uh, there's more. But I want to move on to bad business decisions because I want you to know that I'm just as bad of a businessman as I am as a brewer. Uh, that's important for everyone to understand. <laughs> so uh, when we opened uh, Barrel of Monks, we were Belgian inspired, right? Belgian first. And because I had been in such a bubble of what people were into, now listen, I, I under, even understand that even at the time we opened, craft beer nerds weren't really into Belgians. But I still believe that like this niche kind of brewery could work because there were enough people that were interested in these niche styles and uh, really were into specialization. I, if I could go back and do it again, I would have done Belgian beer, 100%. But I would have gone out the gate with not just Belgian beer, <laughs> because yeah. when we launched and we didn't have an IPA and we didn't have a lager and we didn't have any of the things that most people were familiar with that when they walked into a brewery the first time, and we thought that if we just put out videos on social media and told people in interviews or whatever that we used nothing but Belgian inspired ingredients and everything was European malt and hop and everything was this way, we thought that would matter. And it didn't, <laughs> did not in any way, shape, or form. It was, uh, it was a huge misstep in just launching the brewery. And and by the way, I still believe in specialization. I think that people can be really good at one thing and they can focus on it. But the idea, specifically in South Florida, that we could somehow educate a clientele on this style of beer. Uh, when there is no means to educate them, as Mike just said, no one was following our social media account. And the ones that were, weren't even getting it. Like they weren't getting the information. So it was just preposterous to think that we were going to uh, exist and thrive as a purely Belgian brewery from the get. And while I wasn't the one that came up with the, the initial concept, I was gung ho and all for it. I, I believe we had to be this. You know, no IPAs, only European malts and hops, only Belgian ale yeast. 
And it took me many years to realize how wrong that was. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was wrong about, I think, I, yeah, I was wrong about hazy IPAs. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like, the, I was such a per, like, I was such that guy who said, you can do this beer without it being hazy. And there are still beers out there that I think do a fantastic job of accomplishing that that flavor profile uh, of hazy IPAs without being hazy, murky, um, and, and so forth. One that I just had for the first time a couple days ago, uh, Kevin would will love ha uh, hearing that I finally had this beer, Broken Skull IPA. Stone Cold's uh, <laughs> beer. I have nothing to uh, it. It was on tap at Dixie. Um, fucking delicious beer. Like, really? so, so good. Like, at all of the, the characteristics, taste-wise, I would say, of a hazy, but with, like, a, just a gold, like, very golden, just the mildest bit of haze to it. Like, you can still mostly see through it. Uh, appearance. But I digress. Like, I, I just thought that it was such a flawed thing to do in making beer and not realizing that when done right, because, because most of the beer, those versions that I had were shitty until, like, really Civil came along and started doing them kind of the right way locally and being like, oh, there's a mouthfeel thing to this. They're... It, they're there is something to this other than just flavor and, and aromas and, and appearance and there's body and mouthfeel. And I'm like, Oh man, I get it from the, the really good ones. Like when we had Spencer on uh, a, a while ago, the, the, the hazy that he had sent us that they was a collaboration with uh, Mastodon. It was the name of the beer escapes me at the moment. So amazing. Um, has that, mouth feel and that body uh surf wax from burial um i had a number of times up in north carolina same thing like like holy fuck like this has such a soft mouth feel to it like that has it's it's this weird thing between effervescent but not overpowering like i it, it's hard to explain sometimes but man when those are done right I see where that difference is in the 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 ones that everyone fucking makes and the ones that the really good ones make is they it makes it a true different style and not something that is just a fuck up. I was I was so wrong on it. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I I definitely missed a train on that early on. By the way, we could do a companion episode to this about all the things we were right about, because I predicted that every that, other episode. Well, <laughs> we complain about things, but I mean, there are things like um, we I remember a couple of years ago, it feels like now where we did a whole episode on seltzer, how seltzer was dying. And uh, I think Phil like chimed in like, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Seltzer's through the roof. It's like, yeah, craft seltzer died completely died and we kind of called that that wasn't going to be a thing it was going to be owned by the, the big guys anyway no, I digress. hard iced tea <laughs> uh okay so marketing decision that was really stupid uh we opened our brewery with our flagship beer being named the white wizard now that beer was a white ale it's a belgian white belgian wit the white wizard was a reference to gandalf from the Lord of the Rings. We just thought this worked. It was a really, really good name for a beer. And if I could tell you some of the names that were also suggested during that time, they were pretty terrible. Uh, famously, uh, Bill, my partner, wanted to call our white ale winnowing wit because you winnow uh, wheat by like, like shaking it or something and then like the kernels fall out. It, uh, it it wouldn't have worked. No one would have known what that word was, and it was kind of silly. But there was alliteration there, and it was something. But the White Wizard, right? 
it we just thought it was going to be great and within maybe about a year we almost got into a chain restaurant for like 30 locations on draft and this was when we were pretty young this would have been a huge thing for us and it got to like the last person who had to sign off on it like we got through every layer it was like oh this is just like the formality of someone going yeah this is good and they said yeah i'm not going to put a racist beer on my beer menu and then we started thinking about it and it's like well it's white and the grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan is also, you know, white, unless you're in a Chappelle show sketch. And uh, that didn't work out for us. And there was, was some backlash and we got some negative comments and we missed out early on on one of the best opportunities we would have had to sell a lot of beer and kind of get out there early on with the brewery uh, with real distribution. So we changed the name to The Wizard instead of White Wizard. To this day, I still get people on our social media that will, when we do a post about Wizard, they'll go, I remember when it was White Wizard. You shouldn't have changed it. We shouldn't have done it, honestly. I, I know that the, the, it's a tentative connection in some way, shape, or form, but it was still probably pretty stupid. And uh, it really held us back from several large accounts it was that was the big one but there it, we actually didn't change it just on that account we changed it when a bunch of other accounts mentioned that phil palmasano uh was there at the time he was our sales rep and he came back to us and said guys we gotta change this name this is not working i i told one of your partners very early on i was like this isn't a good idea and they're like <laughs> yeah they you have to really make a stretch to get to there. I'm like, it's a stretch. I? <laughs> I, I think it's kind of a stretch uh, uh, still to this day, but I still, yes. I, and by the way, I don't remember you saying that to me. You might have, but no, it was, a, it was a dumb decision. We shouldn't have done that. And I will piggyback another decision on top of that. And this is a very Phil Palmasano heavy episode. Cause I just called <laughs> out the seltzer thing and talked about this. So I called that seller thing, which might be negative towards Phil, called out Phil for saying the right thing. Now I'm going to go back to our first bottling. So we put in a bottling line. And in order to put in a bottling line, you have to order a lot of materials. And we thought we would be selling a lot of beer because that's our goal, right? We're going to sell a lot of beer. We ended up ordering like four pallets of baby blue bottle caps with the barrel of monks logo on them to go on the wizard the white well at this point it was actually the wizard uh we had changed the name before we went into package and actually put a label on it and phil was convinced that like we're going to sell a lot of beer and we're going to we need we need this and we have to buy in bulk you know get the price down so that we can make the most off the package which he's right about by the way i just switched over to cans and bought a fuck ton of materials we bought enough bottle caps that it lasted us until we decommissioned the line. And even then, I threw away about 40 cases of those bottle caps. We even changed our logo between when we commissioned those bottle caps and about halfway through, we stopped bottling. Those baby blue bottle caps will haunt me in my dreams. And by the way, the company that we got the caps from they had more to send us. We had to pay them to dispose of those bottle caps. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so uh, early on, we had, you know, the, the phrase, you know, your eyes are bigger than your stomach. We mm. really thought we were going to make the wizard the beer. And it turned out that we were only selling about, you know, 60 cases a week. And if we right. continue that, we would have been still using those caps in 2045. Was Wizard the only ones that you used those caps on? Yes, because we picked out a baby blue color scheme. I, I mean, I know those. I know those bottle caps vividly. Like I can, I can picture them <laughs> very easily right now. But I, I didn't even realize that they were just for Wizard. Nope. Uh, like I, other... I can see the black bottle caps uh, too, but I for some reason thought that they were on uh, a couple other brands. Nope. But, uh, holy shit. 
<laughs> and the whole baby blue scheme for all that that uh the marketing and everything around wizard was also a big mistake we should not have done that i have multiple tents with the baby blue scheme it just doesn't work it was uh, a miss across the board <sighs> you know uh like i I'm, I'm trying to think of packaging uh mishaps and there's there's been labels that i have i have put out that were not not my favorite or 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 like ended up being mistakes that i i had pulled like really pulled for and i can't remember any specific offhand but i know a couple times ordering labels that i i somehow got I, i told them the wrong uh unwind direction uh, so for for those of you that that don't know, like think think of a to- a toilet paper roll and and when the the toilet paper is being put on, it can go one of two directions. Uh, I mean, in, even like you know, you flip it over. People like to do that, but your labels are on in a very specific way. So. Pulling the label off and going onto your can on an automated system, you need to make sure that you're pulling off, going through that labeler in the right way with your label oriented top side up, bottom side down. Makes sense. Well, there was a few times where didn't give the right direction. There's a there's rewind uh, or unwind uh, numbers, and I told them the wrong one, and so we would get a label uh with the wrong direction so in order for it to feed correctly through our system it would have had to be upside down uh which doesn't work (laughs) um so we had to sometimes you you that happens you can just send it back to them and they will do it for you but if it is for like a specialty beer that you're trying to get out in a timely manner it's taking up tank space you don't really have that time to mail something back to them, have them do that, then have them mail it back to you again. So we had to a couple times completely unwind a label and then manually rewind it onto the spool in the correct manner so that we could do it again. Um, a, a, a fucking silly, silly, silly mistake, but it it happened probably like twice to me. So we've had many times where our label manufacturer has given us the wrong wine direction and they've shown up. And my first horror is I fucked up yeah, and I did this and I have to pour through emails going, okay, actually asked for the right thing. It was their mistake. It doesn't change the fact that you have to still use those and figure it out just like you're talking about. But at least when it's off your head, it's good. Uh, here's a, here's a mistake that I made in distribution so there's a very large chain i think 40 to 50 locations in florida that i uh worked for years probably maybe maybe a year and a half to get our beer into and i got our b i got a beer uh, which was then called witty and pink uh later to be called wizard and pink it was our beer that we do for breast cancer awareness month Proceeds go towards Making Strides Against Breast Cancer, a wing of the American Cancer Society. They're wonderful people. If you're thinking about donating money uh, to anyone who's doing work in that in that field, they should be the people you do it. The money goes towards treatment. Uh, the money towards goes towards people, not advertising. So that's my little plug there. But anyway, so I got this large chain on board. And they were going to buy, I mean, upwards of 50, 60, 70 half barrels because there was 40 or 50 locations. And yes, they didn't do a lot of craft beer, but the better accounts would have gone through a couple half barrels in a month and the silver accounts would go through one. And this was a big coup. And we thought this would be a stepping stone into something greater. Not only are we going to raise money for a good cause, it's going to be good for our business. And I worked every angle of this. I got this guy on the phone. I'm talking to him constantly. I got more than one distributor and they sell the beer for different, different prices. I didn't account for that. So one of my distributors 
then this whole thing is happening. It's going on for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. It needs to be bought in. Every account needs to be bought in by mid-September or the third week of September. So that beer is ready to go on October 1st. And it's like a Friday night. And I get a call from this guy saying, you didn't tell me the correct price for this beer. A bunch of my locations are rejecting the beer from this distributor. What kind of bushly bullshit is this? I apologized profusely, said I'll figure something out. I then hung the phone up and collapsed onto my couch <laughs> in just total despair, like I had screwed everything up because I did not account that one of my distributors charged like $3 more for a keg. I mean, it's an overlooked thing. I mean, I, I you know, human it beings is. are fallible. And three bucks is not that much. <laughs> but it still completely screwed up that relationship. I ended up getting everything worked out through my distributor. I ended up, like, asking them to... Uh, they dropped the price of the beer. I reimbursed them. I, we figured it out. But I never did business with them again. Oh. Uh, so, you know, this... This one, I don't, I, I, it is partially my mistake. It, it's a lot of people's mistakes all in one, but you know, it, it was such a distributor cluster fuck that I, I didn't even have this one on my mind, but you talking about, about this, uh, brought it up in my mind. And especially with it being fall because it involved a, a fall beer at our, our first brewery, my first brewery, previous brewery, uh, we, we had opened up some distribution up in Philly. And the distributor up there wanted to bring in 200 cases of our pumpkin beer. Like, oh, okay, that's a big fucking order. Like, let's let's do that. We we packaged it, had it in our 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 big walk-in cooler that was primarily for distro, marked as such. Uh, they set up a refrigerated truck pickup that was going to be coming picking it up and. Sending it up to them, I I told the the guys out in the brewery, I'm like, okay, uh, this order is coming in today. Here's the bill of lading. Uh, here, not not just the bill of lading for the trucking company, but also our own bill of lading that it has an itemized thing on it. Get the truck driver to to sign off on this because we need that for our accounting. Done, done, done. Sweet. A couple days later. Uh, guy up at in the Philly distributor goes, "Hey, we only got a hundred cases." I'm like, hmm. Like you should have gotten two hundred. I like we packaged two hundred. We had it set up for for two hundred. I have the uh, the bill of lading that says two pallets uh, on it from the trucking company to and my bill of lading. So I'm like, all right. Called the called the trucking company and I'm like, okay, well, we'll we're looking into this and like, no, it's only one. I'm like, I have a bill of lading that says like the the driver signed saying he picked up two pallets, and like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Finally, the trucking company comes and goes, hey, we have video of the truck that picked up at a transfer station unloading and going to the next truck like okay sweet one pallet came off that truck of cans like what the fuck and, and you know what something that i should have done at the very start of all of this i walk into the back walk-in cooler and I see a fucking pallet of 100 cases of pumpkin beer that says Bella Vista Distributors on it. And then I'm like, fuck. Like, like yes, I can, I can rag on my seller guy who loaded this truck. Yeah, I can rag on the fucking truck driver who was like, yeah, I'm here to pick up two pallets. And... Only one went on his truck, and he still signed off on all of it. My my guy, who only put one pallet on, despite that it said two. Uh, but then, at the end of the day, I could have very easily, at the beginning of all this, this took like a week. I Like, the first day, I could have walked into our cooler and been like, oh, that pallet is still in here. 
You mean you guys don't have this pallet that I'm looking at right now? You can't teleport it to the right place? Uh, <clears throat> I, I was a part of the decision. I wasn't the final decision maker. But I was a part of the decision to buy a goddamn bottling line in like 2018. That was really stupid. It wasn't 2018. Was it 2016? I think it was 2016. Okay, but even 20, still 2015, same. 2016. Because I remember it was Phil, Philly oh, yeah. CBC. Yeah. And okay. it was right, right before your wedding, wasn't it? I don't know. I don't. I can't remember when the whole. I mean, Phil. When did was you get married? There. I got married in 2016. Okay, so yeah, it was yeah. Uh, it was CBC 2016. Um. So, but regardless, we 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 did bottles. If we had not done bottles, if we had got a canning line at that time, we would have made hundreds of thousands of more dollars over the past several years which would have put us in a much better financial situation. And we were uh, seduced in some way by the idea of like the class of bottles and the classic nature of bottles, the fact that Belgian beer belongs in bottles. But one of the main things was we were still with Brown Distributing and Jason Brown, one of the owners, said, we love that you guys are going to do bottles. Everyone's going to cans. You're going to be unique on the shelf. And that's going to set you apart. And if I could have gone back in time and slapped the shit out of myself and said, don't fucking do that, I would have done that. Because we have wasted so much money, so much complication to our business. It's heavier, more materials. Everything is so much simpler with cans. And at the end of the day, we got to a point where, yes, there are still people. I, I got a... a message on social media recently from a uh, uh, an account saying, hey, I'm trying to get your bottles. Uh, wh where do I get them from? And I said, bottles or package? Bottles. I'm trying to get more bottles. I can't find any bottles. And it was like a high-end resort. There are still accounts that want bottles, but it's like two to five percent. Yeah. There are 20% of accounts that say we reject anything glass because we're on the beach or it's it's too much or it takes up too much storage. You cut yourself off from accounts by not having cans and the accounts that you cut yourself off by not having bottles in 2024 is a fraction of that. Yeah. Yes, I didn't know it was going in that direction. And yes, we were trying we were still doing 750s. Uh, more of them. We were doing bottle conditioning on our 330s. It made sense for us at the time. But had I had any kind of insight and probably a little more backbone, I would have pushed back on that. And I didn't. And it has really affected us financially. We're now doing it. And it's funny when we're putting out <laughs> social media posts saying, look at us at our new canning line. And people are going, oh, we yeah, you you join modern society. Good, good, good for you. Do you also have color TV? Do, you know, it's it's, it's <laughs> ridiculous. The, are there also people who are like, you've been doing cans, like? Was... Well, I haven't seen those particular. Okay. Uh, responses, but I mean, we've been pretty adamant about th these are the core beers. No one's ever seen Havana or Wizard or Waypoint in a can at a Total Wine and More. No one's ever seen that at a Publix, mm -hmm. and they're now rolling out in Publix and Fresh Market and Whole Foods and all those places. So uh, I think it's still novel. I still there, there's still people that are are seeing it for the first time, and there's still people that are annoyed by it and saying. I out of curiosity, are you guys going to try can conditioning triple? I would love to, but it's... Uh, you labor intensive right now? I, you know, I'm having a hard time. I'm so far m removed from the brewing process and everything that's going down um, down there. Cause I say down there because my office is on the second level. Uh, and Bill, who is a, a big... Uh, part of any R and D and anything that happens with the the beers is now living half the time in Tennessee. So 
with him not being local and me being with my hands kind of out of everything and the guys just having to get their stuff done. I mean, this might be a cop out, but I feel like I don't want to add more complication to what they're doing. Like I would like to experiment with it, but what's that experiment going to cost in time? Are they going to be having to work later on a Thursday that they don't have to work later on? Uh, is it going to make their lives easier just to, you know, force carve the triple? I know it will be, will be better if it's partially conditioned, but to get it right, are we going to have to do it 20 times, five times? What's it going to be? Yeah. So we haven't really, it's one of those things that we've talked about. And I feel like everybody involved just purposely like kicks the can a little farther down the road because they don't want to have to deal with it. And, and you know, the, like, yeah, I, I feel like that's, that's a battle that doesn't need to be fought right now uh, where like, like you said, how many times are you going to have to try it before you get it right? And how much extra time is that, that your brewery guys are, are working to work on that when they could be doing other things or home, uh, it, having lives um so yeah kudos for that i just thought i'd ask but uh i'm i'm glad to see that you're like you know if the time comes the time will come um but are you you guys gonna do as i'm getting into talking your business uh you're gonna put them in like 750s or something or you're just gonna triple so no triple is going into a 12 ounce six 12 pack. ounce counts okay 12 ounce six pack we're going to continue to do 750s they just bottled hand bottled father christmas or, i'm yeah. sorry they, they didn't do they didn't do i think they did the barrel age father christmas but they're going to have to do father christmas like 100 cases of 750s and a hand bottler uh so i actually asked asked ralph uh months ago when we were trying this canning project and i said listen if we do this it's going to be a real pain in the ass two or three times a year to bottle a lot of 750s. But every week when you're packaging, it's going to run like a dream and you're going to be a happier man. And he said, I will happily change, uh, exchange one for the other. So yes, we are still doing 750s. Everything's going through a hand bottler. Um, and for the beers that we do a, a decent amount of, that's a pain. But, you know, uh, I'm thrilled about it. I'm excited that Three Fates will be in a six pack of 12 ounce instead of a four pack of 16 ounce just in the tap room because I feel like it's so much more accessible. You know, uh, there's not a lot of triples out there, but the ones that are out there and that are actually selling, they're in six packs. Yeah. Nice. Um, I- this kind of this is a shitty way to fucking end, but it just goes back to my my uh, just mistakes with social media. Like, is uh, a mistake with a, a photo, and this this one grinds me more because I take way more pride in uh, creating visual art than I do just writing fucking things down. Um, and and I'm usually very good about like taking practice shots, scanning like my my surroundings, making sure like everything is is cool. But you know, one one time I was taking a shot of of a beer, like I did. It was um, it was one of the hazies that we did, and I did a few different locations. The beer was called Catatonic Iguana, uh, which it was well, actually it wasn't a hazy. It was a cold IPA, but it was. The, the the whole thing is around when it gets cold down here, uh, iguanas go into a kind of dormant state and will just fall out of trees. They don't die. They just cease to exist for a little bit until it warms back up and they come back, they snap back into it. And so I, I did some some shots of the can in a tree and then on a gra- on the ground. And the shots that I took on the ground, there was a big cigarette butt right next to the can that I did not see when I was taking the shots. Did not see when I was editing the the photos. 
and then put them out there, and then someone's like, be nice if that cigarette bot wasn't so close to that can. I was like, oh, fucking Christ. Like, I, and I could have edited it out, like, if I would have noticed it, but I didn't. And it was right, right fucking there. And that one, it pissed me off so much just because, like, personally. Because, like, yep, I, I fucked that up and could have caught it at many different states, and I didn't. You know, Mike, I just want to address this episode in general. And this is, I think I'm missing Tim particularly on this, because he may, he, maybe he would have not have balanced this out as I'm kind of speaking this, but I talked about pulling a bunch of wrong clamps and taking a bath and many different liquids that cost my brewery money. I, I cost, I, I talked about uh, decisions that would potentially put a business into bankruptcy because of their financial irresponsibility. And you're telling me about a few social media posts and a cigarette butt. <laughs> you were talking about how, oh, I could come up with so many things. I feel like the things that you came up with were very minor compared to the things that I well, came up with. And that's- listen, I don't have that's a okay. checkbook. <laughs> it, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> um, but listen, it just goes to show you that you are a way more intelligent uh, person than I am. And uh, much that better representation- true. M much better representation of this business and i'm just kind of a dope maybe you if have, tim was on here he would have talked about all the millions of dollars that he cost his breweries over the years you have you have way more responsibility in in your brewery than i have ever had in any brewery uh that i have worked in so like the, the, it's just the potential for screw-ups is way more <laughs> it's, it's just like i mean uh I, I know I've probably screwed up grain orders before with like with with something. Uh, there, there's one time that we got an entire pallet of special B that I thought that I fucking somehow ordered that, and then was like, oh, was so relieved that I'm like, oh god, it's not on the PO. Like I didn't, I didn't send that. Um, I also do remember that I reached out to you and, and because the, the what they BSG recommended is like. Are there any other breweries around you that maybe need some and they can buy it off of you? <laughs> like, I know one brewery who, who uses Special B. I'll and ask them. I think even, I asked you. And even <laughs> they need four bags a year. <laughs> they don't need it all the time. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, if, if, I, if I had a checkbook... And I, I had as much responsibility as you do. I'm sure I'd be fucking up shit like that. And if I was on Thanks, a brew Mike. deck, like, <laughs> it, uh, like, and that's the thing. Like, I never wanted to be on a brew deck. Like, I didn't want to brew beer. Um, I did it a couple times at Moss Mill, um, but I, I made it very clear when I went to, went to Copper Point. I'm like, I don't want to be on a brew deck. I don't want to make, make beer. Just leave me, like I want to work in the cellar. I'll do packaging. I, like my goal is to be marketing. Like that's that's what I where I want to be. Uh, so like I I purposely tried to keep myself out of some of the the problem <laughs> areas, but you know doesn't doesn't mean that you're not gonna make mistakes. It's important. No, I mean anyone who's been in, in this industry for a long enough time has made several mistakes and you think you know you weigh all the possibilities when you're marketing or everything that you're trying to do and sometimes it's it hits and sometimes it doesn't and because as you mentioned earlier on we do often present ourselves as as having some kind of um, expertise in this industry it's important to be humble and to say, like, yeah, I've made a lot of mistakes. If I could go back and do it over again, I would do so many things different. I mean, forget the individual things. You know, uh, this was not me, but my some of my former brewers once, in trying to put a tank in the right place, a new tank, dropped it on the brew house. They dropped the tank on the brew house. That's not a good thing. That broke a bunch of or bent a bunch of pipes and was could, could have potentially killed somebody. Things happen uh, in in the brewery, and uh, it's important to own up to those things and have uh, and eat a little bit of humble pie every now and then I, come back and say that we're experts again. 
I'm very thankful that like the the mistakes that I have made have been like have not hurt anyone like physically uh myself or anyone else because like it it's it's always been a thing that like at least when i when I realized what a dangerous industry it is that we work in, especially in the brewery uh that i I made safety a, an important part of of what I do and the fact that I have seen people get hurt for ignoring simple safety precautions and I have seen people saved by it because of my bickering like I, I just talked about this with someone fucking last week at the previous brewery like when we implemented safety glasses having to be on inside the brewery at all times it it rubbed some people the wrong way because they weren't used to it and having to always correct people having to babysit and be like get those glasses off the top of your head and put them on your fucking face and one of the people who was like just the biggest repeat offender and and, and I don't even care at this point. I wasn't given the fucking power to tell someone to get the fuck out of the brewery if they disobeyed me X amount of times. Just had to keep on being a fucking warning, warning fucking bitch. But I told this guy, like, put your fucking glasses on. Puts the fucking glasses on. And not five minutes later, gets hit in the face with the end of a brewery, brewing hose that, if you don't know what it is, it's fucking stainless steel, it's fucking heavy, and it's fucking sharp. And hits him right on the glasses, saves his fucking eye. Does that make him fucking any better? Nope. It, glasses are back up on the top of his head like ten minutes later. Uh, this has nothing to do with my mistakes. I don't, I'm, I, <laughs> I don't really know where I'm going with this. But it, it's just... I Oh, yeah. that The fact that... Uh, my, I never made any safety mistakes that hurt myself at, or hurt other people. Uh, I'm very proud of that. Um, I'm, I'm going to make a, a silly uh, accounting error, inventory error, putting ingredient error, putting something in there, spelling error. Those things are going to fucking happen. I am human. But uh, you know what? I'm, I'm fucking glad that I, I haven't hurt myself uh, from a mistake like that. I'm glad that you have not hurt yourself either, Mike. Uh, so we've put out some of the mistakes that we've made. I would be interested. Listen, we have like so many people who listen to this show who are in the industry. It would be interested to hear anyone that wants to like kind of chime in about For things that, yeah. that they that they have done because it be, it's just kind of natural. And a lot of the things that I mentioned were early on in my career where I really didn't know what I was doing and doing things for the first time or the, even the fifth time. And until things are kind of like committed to memory, you make a lot of mistakes, but it, it is interesting. One of the things I keep going back to, and I was trying to kind of recall these moments was trying to like bring my mind back to that. The, oh fuck period. Where was I at when I was like, Oh fuck something has gone terribly wrong and I need to fix it. And thankfully, most of those moments have not been my fault over the last five years or so, but enough of them have been my fault over over time to, to talk about. Well, I think that that's a good, good enough place as any to uh, end this and head into last calls. So... Let's do that. The the point in time where we give each other an unspecific amount of time to talk about whatever it is that we want, beverage-related or not. The only rules are that it is uninterrupted, unopposed, unobjected. I'll start things off here because Kevin looks a little uh, perplexed as to what he's going to talk about. Um, I put this out uh, very slightly on the beginning of our our last episode, but I'd like to go a little more in detail to this um as i'm sure that most people are aware of by now uh the effects of hurricane helene that uh impacted the western north carolina area um 
for those who live there, those who visit there, um, it's a beautiful fucking place. It's a wonderful place. Um, my family and I just went up to Asheville for the first time a couple of months ago, and I fell in love with the area. Like, it's, it's breathtakingly beautiful. The people are so incredibly nice. Um, great food, great beer. Um, and to see the destruction that was caused there is heartbreaking in every reasonable way. But the thing that really grabbed me was the community that came together after that to help one another. And like it brought me to tears some days, seeing people helping each other from something that they didn't think would ever happen to them. And for good reasons, kind of should think that way. But, you know, climate change, the world's fucking weird. Um, I have been, I've said on this show many times before that I love the brewery burial out of Asheville. Their beer is solid. Their artwork appeals to me. It's very dark. It's very metal-like. Uh, their photography is great. Um, but what they have done for their community after uh, this this tragedy has been nothing short of amazing. Uh, they They opened up their doors to their communities with fresh water that they had in their tanks. Um, giving away food, giving away dry goods where they could get some. They brought in chefs and restaurants who could help to give away food. Like all of this, giving away, giving away beer, uh, bringing power strips out of their breweries to be like, charge your cell phones. Like so much good. Um, and, and, you know, like I, I just had to reach out to them and just say like what you're doing is an amazing fucking thing um and i we we as a family have donated money towards a number of of causes such as like the red the red cross uh world central kitchen uh jose andres is amazing charity um another one that i would love for you to all know about is i i'm going to mispronounce this one of two ways it's either be loved or beloved Asheville. Um, it is a, a nonprofit in Asheville that they are doing a ton of work in the area to help people out. Um, it, the, the devastation is just uh, unimaginable, really, for a mountain town or like a mountain region to be facing from a hurricane. And I really hope that these people bounce back and I hope these businesses bounce back. Seeing Zillacoa doesn't fucking exist anymore a wonderful brewery that i got to visit the, the new belgium was flooded out and they are they're swearing they're going to rebuild uh like new belgium one of the biggest breweries in our country's uh facility was completely flooded out by uh by the river and uh, like i really hope that they build back and they build back better and they 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 get good because that is a fucking amazing area that I I look forward to visiting many times throughout the rest of my life. Um, so yes, please donate where you can. I, I we know that we our state uh, just went through Milton. There's a lot of stuff to donate to that too. Um, the Red Cross is always a good catch-all. I, I I know that that might sound like a cop out, but like you can designate where you you want your funds to go help out. But yeah, some of us locked out, like Kevin and I. Um, and with that, like, let's help the people who didn't. And yeah, please give. I I'll put links in the description on our website. Kev? Very thoughtful, Mike. And I will turn from something important that you should really be paying attention to, to something trivial and unimportant in pop culture as I so often do. Uh, so I have been re-watching re the entire run of The Twilight Zone. It's available on Amazon uh, through, I think, Tubi, I think is the name of the platform. I'm very confused about 
all these platforms sharing on any other platform. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I'm just a crazy old man shaking my hands at a cloud. But it is available on Amazon or through Amazon. I love the Twilight Zone. I've loved the Twilight Zone my entire life, as long as I can remember, which is funny because it happened, the original run of the Rod Serling Twilight Zone happened way before I was born. It, it is a uh, pop culture phenomenon that I had to experience kind of secondhand uh, through, you know, um, things like New Year's Day, uh, marathons and things of that nature. But Twilight Zone is an amazing show. And in its best, it uh, takes on social constructs and challenges them at best it's brilliant at its best it's some of the best writing that's ever happened on television and there is a youtube channel called channel awesome that does a breakdown of every single twilight zone episode and they call it the twilight tober zone which has been going on for now for five years this is the end of it. They've been breaking down 31 episodes of The Twilight Zone every year for the past five years or thereabouts. And this is the last year that they're breaking down episodes because they're going to come to the end of the series here. And it's really great. Any fans of The Twilight Zone, once again, watch the shows. That's great. But if you love more content and want to learn more about the episodes and hear someone that is really passionate about these episodes and sometimes says like, Oh, this one was crap. This one was not a good episode or wants to give you more like kind of fanfare about why this other episode was so good. It's really, really fun and interesting. My dad has been watching these for years. I don't even know if he's been watching ones that have come out uh, this month. I guess we're going to find out because he's going to hear this and he's going to probably chime in and let us know. Uh, but the Twilight Tober Zone on Channel Awesome is really cool. If you have a chance to watch Twilight Zone on any uh, one of these, um, from any one of these sources, and you haven't watched it, it's great. But engaging with this content from people that are like breaking it down and really appreciating it is something that I love. That kind of secondary experience of brilliant media that kind of transcended what was possible before it existed is really, really cool. And I highly recommend you check out their site and check them out. Oh, that, that sounds awesome. Uh, I know that we, we don't do comments on this. So after the show, I do have a comment for you we, about that. There's no, there's no real rules. No, just on. something that like, and, 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 you know, it's, it's not in uh, like a response necessarily, but, um, Companion pieces is something that uh, I like. You reminded me of this book that I've been meaning to 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 buy recently, um, called uh, "Lost Back to the Island." That is a companion piece to the television show Lost uh, that just recently came out. To where they have an essay written for every single episode of the show, and. I was a huge fan of Lost. I still consider myself a huge fan of Lost. I like I I think that I am probably one of very few people in my group of friends who liked Lost, who who understood the the finale and liked the finale. Um I didn't love it, but I didn't hate it. And I definitely did not get it wrong like a lot of people did, but uh I, I really want to go and check that book out because I read an excerpt online from one of the episodes that was uh, really, really awesome. So uh, I'd love to, I would love to rewatch that show again at some point, but man, that is a, that is a commitment for a 40, soon to be 42 year old with uh, three year old twins. But uh, I could probably read, read a book over a few months. I know we've talked about the channel uh, Screen Crush. Yes. Uh, before. Have you seen, they did, uh, within the last couple of months, they did a breakdown of the last episode of Lost. Talking no, I about didn't see that. What it meant. No. You should look at it. I, I have it on like one of my playlists. I haven't got to it yet. But because you're such a big fan, you should probably check it out because Screen Crush is awesome. It's, it's yeah. a really, really great it, it's, channel. It's, it's very informational and lighthearted too at yeah. the same time like they don't and, 
they don't take themselves too seriously either. But it's well researched and fun, yeah. and I tend to enjoy. I tend to agree with a lot of their takes, which is probably not the barometer I should be using for my uh, media because that gets us all into trouble. But it, it is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, you want to plug anything, Kevin? You want to you want to tell everyone where to donate money to for breast cancer research one more time? Yes, and I, don't, I, and I didn't mean that as a as a pandering, I, I as, thought, a, as I a shitty were, way. But no, for real, do tell people one more time. Okay, and I will not take this as condescension. No, I, listen, um, this is the month. Uh, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. There's a lot of great things you can donate your money to. Mike mentioned multiple things related to hurricanes, like real people dealing with problems. We all have a limited budget. If something touches you about uh breast cancer about someone that you you know you love that's going through it yourself if it's just something that that you care about and you want to donate money to someone and know that the money is going towards something important it is really going towards helping people the vast majority of it is you can go to making strides against breast cancer you can look it up online there are a wing of the American Cancer Society. A lot of people think because it's the American Cancer Society and because it's like nationwide, that somehow it's not local. When you're donating to the local chapters of Making Strides, it is happening in your community. That money is going to helping people. It's getting people rides and getting them to treatments. It's getting people help with diagnosis. This money, it's, it's not Susan G. Komen. And if you care about Susan G. Komen and you want to do donate your money there, I'm not going to tell you not to do it. But so much of what they do is is based on marketing and making sure that the, the awareness part of Breast Cancer Awareness Month is the feature. What I care about and what the people in my business care about is the fact that money is going towards people that are suffering and need help. And if that resonates with you, you know, and you're local. Yeah, of course you can come to Barrel of Monks and buy a, a six pack of the of the Wizard in pink. Don't even do that. Just donate your money directly instead of. I mean, listen. Don't buy a twelve dollar six pack. Just go to Making Strides and make a twelve dollar donation. If you want to get a beer and a couple bucks are going to go towards that, great too. But the most important thing is that money goes towards people that need it. Maybe we should work in not non profit instead of beer. Uh. Better business. Yeah. Better ingredients. <laughs> don't, uh, don't, don't say the next thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. If, um, you know what? For, uh, to, I'm just going to piggyback on my, my last call. Uh, for all the wonderful things that Burial has done for their community, something that you can do uh, to help them through it is they do mail order for their beers uh and their merch um i think they they ship to like 15 different states go to their website uh check out to see if you are one of their states um i'm gonna be ordering a box of beer soon i just wanted to wait for this storm to pass because i want to send them some of my money because i fucking love what they're doing um so if you want to help them out too as a as a business in Asheville that is suffering uh please do so because they they could probably really use the help too so go check out burials website and buy some beer from them and get it shipped to you other than that you can follow the show on social media we're at united we drink on twitter and blue sky we're at united we drink pod on instagram and threads we're on facebook as well we're on all of the major podcast apps such as apple Podcasts, spotify google podcast podcast attic overcast wherever fine podcasts are found as i like to say at the beginning of the show um if you want to support the show financially you can do so in a number of couple ways you can go to our website unitedwedrink.com check out the brands we love page you buy something from any of those lovely, wonderful places such as Made in Cookware, Trade Coffee, uh, or any place like that, and we get a little kickback from that if you use our link. We also have our web store, you know, we drink.com slash store with shirts, buttons, stickers, totes, and all that other fun stuff. Uh, other than that, we'll be back in a couple weeks with a brand new episode. Thank you, everyone, once again. For Kevin, Mike, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>